There's art in artificial intelligence. Uh, let me take you on a journey uh, how we might coexist with the machines. Actually, no existence is no option. The mindset of no existence, because it hijacks our passion and creativity. So I want all of you to become an artist. But first things first. Let me introduce you to the notion of artificial intelligence with something we all know and all do, which is playing games. Uh, in the 1950s uh, of the last century, scientists thought about, would be a good idea to let the computer play games, so to find out how far they can go. And they start with checkers and backgammon, and we all know that, chess. It took IBM around four decades to finally be the world champion, Gary Kasparov, I think, 1994, uh, the world champion in chess. So this was done by a huge computer machine, a so-called single-purpose AI, which was only able to play chess, nothing more. And it does that by calculating around something like 120 million moves per second. So it was sheer computing power at that, at that time. Then there was uh, Jeopardy, the question, no, they answered the question game, as you know. Uh, but this is a bit of a different story. But again, I knew this time Watson won the game uh, a couple of years ago against the best human players. And then there was Go, which is a uh, Japanese board game, the most complex game uh, probably humans ever invented. There are more possible moves in Go than atoms in the universe. So these kind of brute force attack, which was used for playing chess, didn't work anymore. So human players use uh, their intuition to think about the next move. So how to teach a computer to be intuitive. Um, the interesting thing about the new machine is, first of all, it does something that every AI is doing nowadays, which is uh, deep learning. First, you give a set of instructions to the machine, or even you don't give anything at all. There are machines nowadays that simply start playing the game, just finding out what, how it goes. But these guys gave instructions to the machine. Then the machine started to watch, watch actually, uh, something around 120 million games of professional Go players. And finally, something we as humans could never do it was playing uh, games against an older version of itself. Try to imagine you could play against an older version of yourself uh, to improve. So this is deep learning. So this is how artificial intelligence works today. The second interesting thing about AlphaGo, which by the way was done by Google and was just at the beginning of this year, is that is a general purpose AI. What means it can be applied to more or less any kind of human task. So not just playing chess, so this is uh, one solution, but applying that to any kind of human task is much more interesting. So think about the next challenge for machine versus uh, you. So what would it be? Don't think about robots playing soccer. So that doesn't work. It's a different story and it doesn't work because I, I learned that robots won't pass the ball, you know, so they want to score. <laughs> so the next big challenge is playing poker. So I'm, I'm quite interested. Maybe in five years we will see the first poker phase of a machine. So cheating on, uh, on uh, the, the other players. So that's a quite interesting challenge. I thought about four different scenarios to sketch for you what could be a possible future with robots and AI could be. Uh, to make it easier for you to remember, uh, because it's funny, uh, I gave them names from movies. And science fiction movies are always, as you know, very inspirational about thinking about future visions, because these guys are really good at telling stories. 
The first scenario Hollywood taught us, more or less, this is what we know from Terminator or the movie Matrix. So, therefore, it's called Neo, uh, like the movie Matrix. This is more or less, okay, uh, super intelligent robots uh, are exceeding our capabilities. They come back, or they are there, they're wiping us out, um, and, or even worse, like in the movie Matrix, they fool ourselves with a virtual reality and use us as a reliable source of energy. You don't worry too much, because this scenario is Hollywood, as I said. It's not very likely. For two simple reasons. First of all, we as humans will develop further as well. So there will be not Mr. Anderson in the movie Matrix meeting Neo, who's more or less as we are today. So we will develop as well. And the next thing nobody uh, is recognizing because it's, it's not a good story for, for a Hollywood movie is what's the intention? So why should somebody come back and kill us? So, anyone of you likes fishing? Thanks, sir. Okay, so this one is not for you. But for the other people, uh, think about Earth Wars. How much you care about that? Do you know anyone? Uh, would you like to kill them? Are you seeking bloody revenge? No. They are here, we are living on the same ground, but uh, we are not, simply not interested in these guys. So, even they are there. They even don't know about our existence. I come to back that to that back later. My second scenario is more or less a counter scenario to the one I just described. This is from the bicentennial man. I knew that I would <laughs> uh, make this word wrong. Bicentennial man. We see a robot like Robin Williams, uh, more or less being our best friend. So living in our house, uh, talking to our kids, assisting us, falling in love getting married and so on. So the best solution for coexistence probably, but unfortunately it doesn't work, I think. I think that's not true. It's just a counterbalance, as I said, the other scenario. So both scenarios are not too good, I think. Let's move to two other scenarios that might be better. The first one is from probably the most romantic science fiction movie ever, which is Fur. Everybody who never saw it, see it. And there's Samantha, and this is Molly and I, with the charming voice of Scarlett Johansson. And there's Theodore, and he falls in love, a human fellow. And he falls in love with Samantha. So and they have a really good time, but one day Theodore asks a question. Uh, to how many people are you talking while we are talking? And Samantha hesitates, which is quite human. And then she says something like, 3,316. And the next question he probably regrets right away because he asked, uh, are you in love with somebody else? And she says, yes. Uh, how many? Interesting question for you, right? How many? And she says something like 641. So artificial intelligence will exceed our imagination by far. So. Uh, if we are able to create a human-like artificial intelligence, let's say with an IQ of 120, we probably can do that also with an IQ of 500 or 10,000. So that would mean uh, they would just simply leave us. So leave us alone. Remember the Earth War? Yeah. This time we are the Earth War. So they, these guys go. Yeah. And. That's, that's the problem of uh, having the senses and having the knowledge about uh, artificial intelligence. The fun fact about this scenario is artificial intelligence is already here, right now. We just don't see them. We, don't, we are missing the senses. We are missing uh, everything to recognize somebody with an IQ of 10,000. So um, how you can see something if, if you have no vision? how you can hear anything if you have no hearing. So that's the point. My final scenario is called Lucy, according to the film with the same name. And that's not the scenario I like the most, but I think it's the scenario most likely. You remember my critics about the first scenario? So I said humans will develop too in the upcoming years. 
What means we will augment our bodies and mind with technology, for sure. We already do that. So everybody of you has a smartphone. So it took only eight years for this tool to be almost part of our body, almost an extension of our body. We are outsourcing our knowledge, our memory, our decision making, everything to this device. If we are running out of power, we are done. So, and we will continue to do so. So there, is, uh, uh, there are already interesting technologies. So there are these kind of exoskeletons for paralyzed people. There are brain chips for people with brain injuries. There are artificial limbs for people for amputees, or they are a simple pacemaker for people with heart disease. I have a chip implanted in my head, by the way. I'm not often usually a cyborg. So we will we will do kind uh, stuff like this, and you can imagine as soon as a lot of people will come and ask for these kind of augmentations without a medical indication, what would that? So, uh, talking about these scenarios, uh, the next question might be, okay, what, what comes next? What should we do? So, right now, there are many other major shifts going on. There is nanotechnology, biotechnology, uh, there is internet of things, material science. Uh, there are many blockchain technology, uh, probably the biggest invention of the 21st century. So, it's all going on right now. And they're moving fast, exponentially. You know that? It's coming. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So that's the speed of the computer. Unfortunately, not ours. And they are combinatorial, so they amplify each other. And they are self amplifying. So uh, I'm running a bit out of old, old words to describe that, this impact of this technology. And some of you might say, oh, come on, stop it. So that's way too fast, way too blindfold to to continue, so we need to have a break and think about that. If it ever was possible to take a break, it's surely not possible anymore, so we can't take a break. The question is, even if it's a silly question, should we take a break? We saw that all day today, and we have quite a lot of problems, right? So there is the ever again bankrupt the financial system, there is a business logic that drives inequality, poverty, environment, and devastation. There is climate change as a proven fact. We have a lot of diseases we can't cure, and so on. So I think we could use some help. And you might call me uh, optimistic, tech optimistic, even calculated optimistic, but to be honest, there are not so many options to choose from. So there are not so many other solutions we can take to solve all these problems. So we might think about uh, going that way. And the question is how to, how to design the future that it is safe for us, secure for us. No AI it wants to kill us. And first of all, I can tell you how we can't solve the problem. I'm very sure that with the mindset of profit, sales figures, shareholder value, uh, we can't write this is this future. So that wouldn't work. The market for increasing longevity, for instance, is estimated 3.5 trillion US dollar. Nice. But it doesn't say anything about it. do we want that? Do we want to live longer? What are the ethical questions about that? So, is, what's the purpose for that, and so on. So, in any case, this kind of free market economy we are living in might be an outdated model anyway, somehow soon. We don't know anything else, but it was only on Earth for something like 200 years, so it's not quite long. So, it's really good to think about systems outside of this kind of uh, business logic. There's another fun fact, I think. Uh, that actually capitalism seems to be made for robots, actually. So robots will outpace us in any discipline related to efficiency, right? Capitalism loves efficiency. So maybe we should leave that cute couple to the honeymoon and think about refocusing ourselves. So thinking about what actually we can do, at least better than the machines. And 
we have to get off the system, of this system, which is the biggest challenge we probably have. We have to free ourselves from this kind of market-driven economy, more consumption, all that stuff. Uh, and we have to free us, sell ourselves from being reduced by our system, we invent by ourselves, to be robot-like humans or human-like robots, whatever. And how we can do that, of course, focusing on what are we good at. This is creativity, this is passion, this is love, it's failure. So it's not about superhuman intelligence, it's about superhuman creativity and passion. There's a reason why festivals like Burning Man, for instance, are getting so much attention because they try to establish a new value system, a new means of exchange. So therefore, this is interesting to go that way. And again, I'm tech optimistic, you know. Technology can help us with that. There is technology out there like blockchain technology, smart contracts, who help us to create a future which is based on us and not institutions. So there's this kind of saying, okay, think about corporations without management. Think about a financial system without bankers. Think about governments without politicians. This is possible by technology. It's already happened, by, uh, for instance, in Estonia. The crucial point there, then, it is only on us, on everyone, on you and me, to change that. And on us means we have to take that into our hand and create that ourselves with the creativity and the passion we have. And therefore, I would like to ask you today for just one single thing. Go out, explore, adventure, try to be creative, try to be passionate, try to be open, be open, try to become an artist. Thank you.